Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. All right, so this is the second of two lectures for the integumentary system. In this lecture, we're going to talk about skin appendages, the glands, and then the receptors found in the skin. So first, the two appendages, these are created through growth of the epidermis into the dermis. The first we'll talk about is the pilosebaceous unit, which comprises the hair follicle, erector pili muscle, and then an associated sebaceous gland, and then the nails and the nail bed, and we'll talk about that as well. So first, the pilosebaceous unit. This is created from invaginations of the epidermis into the dermis, and this is called the external root sheath. And this is a cross section of a hair follicle. And what you'll see here is that this layer indicated here by this red line in the, in the slide, this is the external root sheath. And one thing to note about the external root sheath is that, as you'll see here, it's several layers deep of keratinocytes, and then it's continuous with the stratum basale and the stratum spinosum layer of the epidermis. So this layer, this external root sheath, represents that, the continuation or invagination of the epidermis layer of the skin. It's surrounded by a thick basal lamina, and you'll see this arrow is actually pointing to this layer right here, as you can see, as it goes around. And it's called actually the glassy membrane because it has this thick, glassy type appearance to it. And as you'll notice in the slide here, it actually separates the hair follicle from the surrounding dermis. So this connective tissue you see here, this is the surrounding dermis layer, and then this would be the glassy membrane separating the hair follicle from it. The hair root itself consists of a number of, so if we look at a kind of a diagram here of a, of a hair root, kind of a cross section. And then surrounding the medulla is a layer called the cortex. And you'll see in anatomy, these are common terms. Usually medulla is the more central region of something. For example, the adrenal cortex, which is a gland that produces a lot of steroid hormones on top of the kidney, is has a medulla and a cortex to it. And there's anatomical regions of the body where there's a medulla, which is the inner portion, and then the cortex, which is the outer portion. One thing I'll point out is that Central medulla is not present in medium and to fine hair. So in those particular hairs, there is just the cortex region. And then external to the cortex is the cuticle. So there's another layer outside of that. And this is the cuticle. This is the outermost layer, and it's composed of a thin layer of heavily keratinized squamous cells. So in the diagram here, this is either a medium or a fine hair. So there's actually no medulla here. This is just cortex. And then surrounding it here, you can see this part, and this heavily keratinized region here, as you guessed it, is the cuticle. So you have glassy membrane, which is a thick basal membrane, basal lamina. Then you have the external root sheath here. Then you have the cuticle here. And then you have the cortex in here. And cells that comprise this internal root sheath, they are producing the soft keratin that will eventually harden to produce the hard keratin as the keratinocytes at the base of, or the bulb of the, of the hair follicle, undergo the keratinization process, similar to the, how they go in the epidermal layer, to then pr actually produce the, the shaft of the hair. So in the previous slide, we showed you a cross-section of the pilosebaceous unit. Here, we'll, we'll show you more of kind of a longitudinal diagram. So this would be epidermis here. And then you're going to have dermis here. And remember, the epidermis is going to essentially invaginate into the dermis to create this external root sheath that will be the outer portion of the hair follicle itself. And then at the bottom here, what you have is where things kind of bulb out like this. Then we come back up here. And the same thing, this is epidermis over here. And so this, this region here 
as we go all the way around. It's external root sheath. And remember, that's just that thick layer of keratinocytes that's continuous with the stratum basale and the stratum stratum spinosum of the epidermis. Then you have the base of the hair follicle, which is comprised of proliferating keratinocytes, which are, again, as we said, those undergo the keratinization process to go from soft keratin to hard keratin to actually form the hair. And so as a result of that, since you have a lot of cells proliferating down here, you actually have significant vascular supply via a dermal papilla. And so you have, you know, blood vessels, a good blood supply coming up here to the base of the to the base of, of the of the bulb of the hair follicle here. Now this region down here where these cells are, where they're proliferating, where these keratinocytes are producing keratin, and then they begin to go undergo the keratinization process to form hair. And so this portion down here where these cells are proliferating is actually called the matrix. And then the other cell down here are melanocytes, and we'll just kind of draw them in with blue lines here. And these produce melanin for hair pigment to give the hair its actual color. Then lastly here, you know, we'll draw the, ha the hair actually coming out of the surface here. And then we'll draw this central line down here through the hair shaft itself. And this will be the medulla. Then this region here would be just outside of it will be the cortex. And then this region here, this outer region here will be the cuticle. And those all together comprise the actual hair. Last couple structures here. So then you're going to have these sebaceous glands, which have these short ducts. These will create a substance called sebum. It's kind of a waxy, oily type substance that secretes onto the hair. We'll talk about these glands in more detail in a couple of slides here. And then the last structure is actually a muscle, a smooth muscle, called the erector peli muscle, which we'll draw in here with this red. And so as we show here, it runs obliquely from the hair follicle to the upper dermis, and then contraction of it causes the hairs to erect vertically. So it causes your hairs to stand up. In a sense, like, you know, you hear the expression, you have goosebumps, and, you know, your hairs all stand up nice and straight. That's your erector peli muscle contracting. So the nail is composed of mainly the nail plate, which is the visible portion. And this is the portion that's over the dorsal surface of the epidermis of digits in a region called the nail bed. We'll actually do a simple diagram here to kind of illustrate this. So remember, this is formed from the invasion of the epidermis into the dermis. And it's a portion, as we say up there, called the nerve, the nail groove. And so we come down like here, and this obviously is going to be epidermis. This portion here would be dermis. And so the epidermis obviously is going to wrap around here. And then this portion here that we're drawing is actually the nail itself. So the epidermis is going to keep traveling here just underneath, and this is actually what is the nail bed. So this portion here is the nail bed. So from here to this end here. And let's, you know, at the tip of any digit, you're going to have a bone. So we'll draw the bone in here like this. And then obviously, like we said, we're going to have the dermis in here. And this is dermis all throughout here. This portion right here, like we said, this is the actual nail plate that rests over the nail bed. And then this more proximal portion here. This is what's called the nail root. And so the nail matrix is actually present under the nail root. It's this portion of the epidermis here. And this is the site where cells will proliferate to generate new cells that undergo keratinization to form the nail plate. 
And remember, keratinization is, again, the process of where you have cells that fill their cytoplasm with keratin. In this case, it's going to be called hard keratin. And like we say here, nail plates, again, are composed of keratinized epithelial cells that contain hard keratin. And this growth process is a, is a continuous process. And so it's continuous in this direction. You keep generating new cells. The process of keratinization keeps going out this way, and it pushes the nail across the nail bed like this. And that's why, you know, every so often you have to cut the tip of your nails because they continuously grow. Now, just a few other areas here. So this portion here is called the eponychium. So if we come over here and draw a more superior view of a fingertip, First thing you'll you'll kind of notice if you, if you look at the base of your fingertip, you can even look at it while you're watching this video here, is this kind of crescent white shaped area. This is called the lunilla. And this is the area where you can actually visualize the nail matrix. So it's it's kind of white, that white portion there is actually where you, you can actually see the nail matrix, the portion that is producing the nail itself. Then if you look closely, there's kind of a thin layer of kind of thin skin over the nail, this lunilla portion here at the base of the, of the nail. And that is actually the eponychium. So this kind of, if we draw these kind of lines over here, it's kind of that thin layer of skin over that. It corresponds over here, that's the eponychium. And that's also known as the cuticle. And again, those are just cells from the stratum corneum that cover the nail root. And then the last term is kind of this region right here. This is called the hyponychium. And this is the portion of the epidermis that's kind of under the distal free end of the nail. And then on this slide, we just have some of those terms we went over just so you have it in writing there. So now we're going to go through three types of glands that are found in the skin. So we've already talked about the sebaceous glands when we talked about the pilosebaceous unit and hair follicles. Just to go in deep on some of the details here, again, these are classified as simple branched acinar or alveolar exocrine glands. They're located in the dermis, except in the glands penis, the labia minora, and in eyelids. And they're found in high density in the skin of the face, the forehead, and the scalp. As we mentioned earlier, they're often associated with hair follicles. You can see the hair follicle here and the sebaceous gland here. They synthesize an oily substance called sebum via holocrine secretion. Just to review, holocrine secretions are produced within the cell, within the cytoplasm, and then they're actually released by rupturing the plasma membrane, which actually destroys the cell in the process to create this secretion into the lumen. So it's an apoptotic type secretion in, in a way, if you could think of it that way. Histologically, as far as their histological appearance, if you look closely here, they have round, dense nuclei and then a clear cytoplasm surrounding them. Very distinct look to them. Ecrine sweat glands, these are simple, coiled tubular glands. They're located in the dermis or the hypodermis, especially in the palms and the soles of the feet. They carry out marocrine secretion, which is when the secretions of a cell are excreted via exocytosis into an epithelial wall duct or onto a bodily surface, which in this case would be this, the skin, the surface of the skin. And that makes sense. This is where you're secreting sweat to help cool your body temperature. And this is increased in response to sympathetic stimulation, so that fight or flight response. And again, like I said, important for thermoregulation. The structure of the gland histologically, it's stratified cuboidal epithelium. It's composed of both dark cells, the rich ER, due to the glycoproteins. And you can see that in here, much more basophilic, darker staining. And then clear cells, as you can see more over here and over here, that contain glycogen, water, and electrolytes. They also have myoepithelial cells that surround the gland and contract to help increase secretion of sweat. The duct structure is a stratified cuboidal epithelium with pale luminal cells, which would be in that more superficial layer of the stratified cuboidal epithelium, and then the more basal cells are dark, dark staining. So you can see that here. Here's the more superficial, lighter staining cells, and then obviously over here, all this is much more basophilic and darker staining here in this duct structure here. The other thing is that the steroid hormone aldosterone actually stimulates reabsorption of sodium chloride within the ducts of ecrine sweat glands. And this helps make the isotonic secretion more hypotonic. 
Lastly, the apocrine sweat glands. These also carry out merocrine secretion of a viscous secretion that's metabolized by bacteria on the skin surface, and this actually contributes to body odor. They also secrete odiferous molecules such as pheromones. These are located in the eyelid, the axilla, the areola of the nipple, external genitalia, and the anus. The gland itself is composed of stratified cuboidal epithelium, and you can see that here with the multiple layers of these cuboidal cells and surrounded by myoepithelial cells. Stimulated by sympathetic stimulation, and the function of these glands begins in puberty. Stratified cuboidal epithelium line the ducts, which then drain into the upper part of hair follicles, so just at the surface of the skin. All right, and to close this lecture out, we're going to talk about sensory receptors. Again, the skin is kind of our contact point with the outside world, so a lot of different sensory receptors are present in the skin to give us constant real-time feedback with the outside world. So first you have mechanoreceptors that sense mechanical deformation or stress. There's a number of different types, and we'll actually go over these individually over the next few slides. Then you have thermoreceptors that sense temperature changes. And then you have nociceptors that sense pain that can be caused by excessive touch, pressure, or temperature. So Merkel's corpuscles, these are Merkel cells are nerve endings of unmyelinated axons. They're found in the stratum basale layer of the epidermis, and these are mechanoreceptors for touch. So very superficially located. You then you have Meisner's corpuscle, which are encapsulated afferent nerve endings. These are located in the dermal papillae of the epidermis dermis junction. So here, this is very zoomed in of that junction here. So these would be those epidermal ridges. And then you have the dermal papillae, which are these lighter standing here. And then here's your Meisner's corpuscle right here. And so that's how you can know that it's a Meisner's corpuscle, especially by the location, by recognizing the epidermal dermis junction and then seeing that there. These are highly sensitive tactile receptors, and then the Schwann cells create this kind of swirled appearance to them. Pacinian corpuscle are, is a large, multi-layered, encapsulated nerve ending of myelinated axons. It has sort of this onion-like appearance to it, and this is due to the fluid between the endoneural and capsular layers. These are found in the deep dermis and the hypodermis. So if you do the skin like this, and then the dermis. So these guys are found you know, more down here in the deep portion. And that's because they sense, they sense sustained pressure and vibration. So if you have, you gotta have where you're constantly, kind of a constant force pushing down and the force has to make its way all the way down here. It can't just be some light touch. It's gotta be constant pressing down and those will sense those type of pressure. And then Ruffini corpuscle, this is a small encapsulated nerve endings of single myelinated axons and these sense sustained stretching. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course, which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos, go to our website using the link in the description below.